everybody. Welcome back to Let's Talk Physical Media. My name is John. It's only going to be me hosting this week. Unfortunately, Fate's in Houston, Texas right now, and she's unable to make the show, so it's just going to be the big dog this week. And it was a really, really, really busy week in the world of physical media and film in general, so I'm not going to bury the lead. A big rumor came out this week, and it was an expected rumor, but if you've been watching this channel for any amount of time, you know my favorite film of all time is 1984's The Terminator. Well, it's pretty much confirmed that The Terminator is going to be coming out in either August or September. It's still a rumor, but it was getting reported so much this past week. We all kind of know that it's in the news. You know, we just had the big three James Cameron 4K Blu-rays come out, and everybody's been talking about the Terminator. It's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So if there's ever going to be a year where we get the Terminator on 4K Blu-ray, this is going to be that year. And let's just all have our fingers crossed that we finally actually get it. And actually, a lot of you guys were commenting on the post this week, and one of those comments was from Nick Chang, and he wrote, They better not muck up the Terminator 4K like T2, and it better have James Cameron and DP Adam Greenberg's seal of approval. The current 10-plus year Blu-ray still looks great with a high bit rate, but they've done changes to the sound effects like Arnie's 45 long slot of gunfire sounding a wheezy cough not the same magnum bang like dirty harry so yeah that's what a lot of people are most worried about this week obviously the james cameron 4k blu-rays have created a lot of controversy some people have absolutely loved the changes they made for aliens the abyss and true lies some people absolutely hate them me personally when it comes to true lies i didn't mind what they did with the dnr in that one mainly because we haven't had it since dvd so even though the dnr is very 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 noticeable a lot of waxy skin it's still the best version of true lies whereas aliens Aliens, I didn't love the changes to that 4K Blu-ray. I didn't love the changes they made on that film. I still prefer the previously released Blu-ray when it comes to the visuals. You know, the audio... I kind of think they're on even ground. I still might prefer the Blu-ray, but I still and I still haven't seen the Abyss. I still haven't even gotten a shipping notification for that yet. So hopefully I'll get my hands on the Abyss pretty soon because I'm hearing that's the best of these transfers. So people are really worried that they're going to screw this one up like they did with Terminator 2 or in some cases with Aliens and True Lies. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but, you know, obviously I'm just being hopeful because this is the Terminator. Of all the films I've ever wanted to come to 4K Blu-ray, the Terminator is at the top of that list. I want this to be the greatest greatest transfer they've ever done a you know in my little wish list i want arrow video to put this out i want them to put it in the same exact packaging that they put robocop in maybe even throw a steelbook in that packaging i don't know i want loads of new extras i want great reading material now that's asking a lot i don't think we'll get all that i'm just being really hopeful there is no announcement on the date the studio doing this yet so you know right now it's still kind of a rumor so i'm not going to get my hopes up or even be let down just yet we're just going to wait a little bit of time and another big rumor that came out this week is also another 1980s film that i absolutely love and that's apparently warner brothers is going to be releasing purple rain on 4k blu-ray another film that i absolutely Absolutely love from the 1980s and Prince is one of my favorite artists of all time Purple Rain is one of my favorite albums of all time I just absolutely love Prince you know you guys have heard me drag on and on about Batman 1989 the Danny Elfman score Michael Keaton Jack Nicholson Tim Burton well another big thing about that movie is that Prince did the soundtrack for that and I just absolutely love the soundtrack for Batman 89 always love Prince. When he died, that's one of the celebrities along with Robert Williams, Meatloaf, Toby Keith, Bernie Mac. I just can remember where I was when they died and it just like broke my heart. You know, I just didn't expect that. I just, I absolutely have always loved Prince. He's one of the greatest musicians ever. He's just so talented. And we scream at each other. This is what it sounds like when the doves cry. And Purple Rain is a fantastic 1980s film. It's just going to be so colorful when it comes to 4K Blu-ray. I cannot wait. And it's Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers usually doesn't screw up their transfers. In fact, I actually really do like the technology that they use for their transfers. So I'm pretty excited. And again, this is just like Terminator. This is not confirmed yet. So I don't want to get my hopes up too much. This is still just kind of a rumor, but it's pretty much confirmed. And then another rumor that kind of piggybacks off of a new story we talked about last week was that South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut was going to be coming to 4K. K Blu-ray in June and somebody actually commented on the video that they didn't care about that because they wanted Team America World Police to come to 4K Blu-ray and then this week we get a rumor for the same date as South Park Bigger Logger and Uncut on 4K Blu-ray but this time they're talking about Team America World Police so I have no idea what's going on again this is just a rumor just like South Park and when you go on Blu-ray.com they don't have a listing for Team World Police but they do have a listing for Bigger Logger and Uncut so I don't know are we going to get both of them are we only going to get one of these films in June are these just rumors that are just floating around that nobody really 
knows for sure. I don't know. My gut tells me we're going to get only one of these films on 4K. Don't know which one. We'll have to wait and see. Both of them are celebrating anniversaries, so I don't know. I'm not 100% sure on this one. Hopefully, we get them both on 4K Blu-ray because both of them have fans. Gun to my head, though, I still prefer Team America over South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut, like I talked about last week. You know, I think the film itself doesn't quite hit the quality of the TV show, whereas Team America World Police is just absolutely hysterical. I saw that movie in theaters at a way too young age. I should not have been in that movie, but the local theater by me just did not care about R rating, so they had no problem letting a 12-year-old into an R-rated film like that. And I was grateful for it, so I hope that's coming to 4K Blu-ray. And then the only 4K Blu-ray that we actually got confirmed is that Ray Rango is going to be coming to 4K Steelbook in June, and Rango is a great underrated animated film. Actually, Roger Deakins did the cinematography for this animated film. It stars Johnny Depp doing the voice work for it. And this is another movie that I saw back in theaters. I haven't actually revisited it since, but now that it's coming to 4K Blu-ray, like I said, the cinematography for an animated film to look that good, that's what I remember most about the film. You know, it really is just a Western, an animated Western. So I'm really looking forward to Rango coming to 4K Blu-ray. So we got a lot of rumors this week, a lot of exciting rumors with the Terminator Purple Rain, two of my favorite films ever. Obviously, The Terminator is the big one. I really hope we get some confirmation on who's going to be doing this transfer suit. Hopefully, it's just a new scan of the camera negative. Hopefully, we put some HDR, maybe some Dolby Vision over it. Maybe put that new AI DNR on the back burner. I know some people like it, but I don't want to risk it when it comes to The Terminator. But again, that's just me being selfish because I'm such a huge fan of the film. No movie has ever meant more to me personally than The Terminator. So obviously, I want all the bells and whistles. But again, that's just me being selfish. We'll have to see what we get and we'll just hope for the best. But that's going to do it for the news this week. Let's start it off with the Q&A portion of the show because we have so many questions to answer, so I'm not going to waste any more of your time. And I'm actually going to answer the first two questions, which were the last two questions to come in today. And this one came from Tony the Lone Rider Smith, and he wrote, Hope I'm not too late, but what are each of you and Fate's top five favorite ensemble movie casts? For me, it's the original Star Wars trilogy, original Star Trek movies, Star Trek TNG movies, The Next Generation, Zack Snyder's Justice League, and the Fast and Furious movies with Paul Walker. Well, Fate's not here this week, but I'm still going to answer the question, and I'll give you guys my top five favorite ensemble films, and then we'll get Fate's next week, Tony. So for me, you know, you listed a lot of my favorites, but for me, number one is going to be Ocean's Eleven. That cast is stacked. Even the really small roles had some actors who would become big-time Academy Award-winning actors, but you also have plenty of other Academy Award-winning actors in this film. The main leads are George Clooney, Matt Damon, Brad Pitt. You have smaller roles played by Bernie Mac and Casey Affleck. You get Julia Roberts in this film. I mean, and these people, especially in 2001, they were at the height of their powers. Yes, Casey Affleck was still on the rise, but this is Bernie Mac really like transitioning to like TV, becoming a bigger film actor, really him just on the rise as far as his career goes. You know, obviously Brad Pitt, George Clooney, and Matt Damon, this is probably them at the top of their game. Maybe Matt Damon went up a little bit more, but nobody in the world looked better than George Clooney and Brad Pitt. And this is a remake of a 1960s Rat Pack film. So Ocean's Eleven is still for me the number one best ensemble picture and at number two i have avengers endgame you know this is more of a recent release but we're bringing in all the big actors throughout the entire mcu franchise all of them at the height of their powers this is where we get robert Downey jr mark ruffalo chris hemsworth scarlett johansson chris evans don shields Tom Hiddleston, I mean, I could just go on and on when it comes to Avengers Endgame. That really is one of the best ensemble casts of all time. You just have so many great actors working on one of the greatest films ever. And for me, the MCU still hasn't hit the highs that we got with Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. I think that as time goes on, we will look back at that time in 2018, 2019 as one of the highs in film history. It really was an event, and that's how Avengers Endgame became the highest grossing film of all time time and then we'll pick a fast and furious film as well and i think that best one has to be fast five not only do we have all the big actors like vin diesel paul walker jordana brewster but this is the film where we bring in the rock who would become one of the best actors in the entire franchise really heightened his career that's kind of why the rock has actually gone back to doing the fast films he's even back in wwe are you guys watching smackdown and raw right now because as we're leading in the wrestlemania we're getting heel rock we're getting hollywood rock who i just grew up loving
Robin, you know, Hugh Rock from 1999, Corporate Rock and Hollywood Rock from 2003. Oh, my God. I'm just getting so nostalgic for it. He's clearly leading into it, but we're still going to see Cody finish his story at WrestleMania 40. I'm sorry. Just a little uh, WrestleMania tangent there. It's March. It's WrestleMania season, guys. So I'm getting really excited about that. I'm going to have to also go with Star Wars, The Empire Strike Back, because I think that that's also the best in the entire Star Wars franchise. But, you know, a lot of people say that a lot of the Star Wars actors don't become bigger after the franchise. I present to you guys Harrison Ford, one of the greatest actors of all time. He appears in this. Mark Hamill himself, maybe he's most known for playing Luke Skywalker, but for a lot of people, he's most known for voicing the Joker. Never call and never write. I still got a soft spot for you. So I'm sending you a fun gift. Obviously, I'm, you know, saying for a lot of people he's most known. He's still most known for Luke Skywalker. If anything, Mark Hamill as the Joker is probably number two at the highest. When you see Mark Hamill, you think, Luke Skywalker, no matter how great of a voice actor he is, and he is one of the greatest voice actors of all time. You also get Carrie Fisher at the height of her powers, and then we bring in Billy D. Williams, and Billy D. Williams, I've always loved him. He's always one of the most charming people on screen. I think he should have had a bigger career than he ever did, because you just, you just get so drawn to him, and especially in The Empire Strikes Back, but even when he plays a small role in Batman 1989, which again, a little mini tangent, I didn't bring it up, but they announced that Batman 89 is going to be coming to 4K Steelbook again, and unfortunately, they used in the same 4K Steelbook that came in the 4K Steelbook packaging that came out a few years ago that included Batman, Batman Returns, Batman Forever, and Batman and Robin. They just pulled that Steelbook out and they're going to resell it. I just don't understand why it's so hard to make a 4K Steelbook version of what the original VHS looked like. All it's got to do is just be plain black and just slap that Batman logo from 89 on it, and then on the side, just use the Batman 89 font along the rim, and that is it. It'll be the simplest 4K Blu-ray you ever made, and I will buy it day one. Trust me, if, if anybody at Warner Brothers is listening, please just give us that 4K Steelbook. Although, I gotta admit, the new one is pretty nice, but we've seen it before. Sorry, I got a little bit off topic again. I have to include a Star Wars film on here, because those are some of the greatest ensemble casts. And then at number five, I'm gonna include a comedy, and that is This Is The End. If you grew up in the the 2000s and 2010s you guys remember all the Judd Apatow films you guys remember seeing Seth Rogen Danny McBride Jonah Hill James Franco and Jay Bernthal they're in the leads of this film but we also get so many different cameos from Craig Robinson Kevin Hart even Emma Watson pops up in this movie I drain pipe for days just try and get some sleep what are you guys doing out here? I'm a massive Harry Potter fan. Jason Siegel giving a great How I Met Your Mother joke. So this cast was absolutely stacked as well. Even just including all the leads, they're all at the height of their powers and just playing along with what we knew from them and during the 2000s and 2010s. And this comedy film, This Is The End, is one of the best comedy films ever. I'm still really surprised this hasn't come to 4K Blu-ray because there was a lot of special effects in this movie, a lot of explosions. I think it would look great on 4K Blu-ray. So those are my top five ensemble pictures. Thank you so much, Tony. I really do appreciate it, buddy, and we'll get fates next week. And the next Kevin Kruger question is, what are your thoughts on my co-workers' hot takes? So we'll take these one by ones. Number one says, the best Nightmare in Elm Street movie is 2010 remakes. Well, your co-worker is 100% wrong when it comes to that one. I'm not even going to acknowledge the 2010 Nightmare in Elm Street film. I think it's one of the worst films just ever made. But you know what? Not going to take it away from him. If he thinks that's the best Nightmare in Elm Street film, that is his right to believe that. I just think he's wrong. Number two is that, only gay actors should portray gay actors. Now, this is one I actually kind of agree with because there are so many gay actors in Hollywood. We just saw last week Love Lies Bleeding starring Kristen Stewart come out. Kristen Stewart is openly gay, and that film's telling a lesbian storyline. I think that Kristen Stewart should be the lead in that film. If anyone is going to be the lead in that film, if you can nail down Kristen Stewart, she should be able to play that role because she is an openly gay actor and a very talented one at that. You know, unfortunately, Hollywood does have a history of whitewashing things. We saw this probably most famously with the Ghost in the Shell US remake, the live action remake of the 1995 Ghost in the Shell anime film, which I think is the greatest anime film of all time. They tried to remake it live action, and they and they cast Scarlett Johansson in the lead role. Well, that doesn't make sense. It's not an American film. You don't cast a white American actor in that lead role. As much as I love Scarlett Johansson, there were plenty of better options that you could have gone with that would actually pay much more respect to the original film. And Hollywood just has a long history of doing this. So when it comes to, you know, gay actors, there are plenty of gay actors 
characters out there, and I think that they would definitely be better in the lead roles, especially in a storyline about gay people. It's the same thing with anything. If you're going to take somebody from a certain group of people, if you could find an actor who could portray that, who actually lives these lifestyles. So, you know, if it comes to a film about black Americans, try and find a black American to put the lead role. Now, I've heard a lot of complaints in the past about us casting British people to play, you know, American people. Does that fall into the same category? I don't know. You know, it's really a tough situation because you do want the person who plays the part the best at the end of the day. But if you could find somebody who actually does fit into that category and they're a great actor, definitely portray them the best. But of course, we can go too far. Bill Burr actually made this joke in the past about people were upset that Brian Cranston played a paraplegic. I don't know how many paraplegic actors are out there. I don't think we could have got anybody else. These people are still actors. They're still there to play a role. And that's what actors do. They fall into a role. But I do kind of agree in a certain sense that if you can get somebody in a certain community to play a certain role, let's try and go that route first before we start looking into other avenues. But at the end of the day, we all just want the person who can play that character the best. What's going to be the best on screen? That should always be the ultimate goal. But try and look at other avenues before you go that route. And at number three, if a movie is sad, it automatically makes them bad. That is not true at all. In fact, I love sad movies. <laughs> I really do. I don't know why, but I just like to actually feel sadness. So I will watch movies like Terms of Endearment, My Life, Beaches, you know, just movies that are going to make you cry at the end, Steel Magnolias. And I really love movies like that. Does that make them bad movies? No. In fact, some of my favorite movies are some of the saddest movies ever. I mean, like I was just saying, Terms of Endearment. Terms of Endearment is one of my top 30 favorite films of all time has one of the saddest endings of all time and you know what it works for that film that movie is the perfect blend of drama and comedy and just because i'm crying at the end that does not make it a bad film in fact it makes it a great film because they got me emotionally number four physical media will be completely dead in five years well you and me, Kevin, both know that is not true. Physical media will never die. I actually think that physical media is kind of on the path that it'll probably be on for like the next five to ten years. It's going to become very niche. Obviously, we've pretty much shifted to online only, but we're still getting so many great studios putting out so much physical media, and I don't see any chance of that ending. You know, the only thing that can really hurt us is the technology itself. If they stop making 4K Blu-ray players or stop including 4K Blu-ray players in video game consoles like PlayStation or Xbox, that could definitely take a hit because then everything's just going to be shifting to digital and hopefully then we get some more companies making some 4k blu-ray players so we can play all of our 4k blu-rays but no i don't think physical media ever will die i think it's going to be just like vinyl where it'll always have an audience it just might not be the biggest audience but all we can do is just tell people how good physical media is and if they want to watch the best version of film it's on physical media you don't ever have to worry about it leaving streaming as long as we can tell people that that's all we can really do and let's just hope that they listen to us but you know what we can't push it everybody likes what they like and at number five any movie that is in black and white is boring well that's just completely wrong not only do i know what they're referring to they're referring to any film that was made in black and white must be an old movie they don't really know movies like the lighthouse which was shot on black and white gorgeous black and white intentionally even movies like raging bull from 1980 shooting it in black and white was a choice you know, black and white can lend itself so well to the film format. The Night of the Hunter is one of the most beautiful. In fact, it is the most beautiful black and white film that I have ever seen. But even if you go back to the 1930s and 1940s, you're just going to skip out on all of those films because they're in black and white. I will never agree with that sentiment. It's the same thing with foreign films. If you can't watch a movie with subtitles, that means you're just going to cast that film aside. You're missing out on a huge part of cinema if you can't watch a movie with subtitles or in black and white. And I have a vision problem. So that means when I'm watching a movie with subtitles, I actually have to sit pretty close to the screen so I can read the subtitles and still get the entire thing. And I have no problem doing that because I'm getting a great film at that. I actually watch it. Usually I watch a film with subtitles on this screen right behind me, unless I'm really testing out the audio, then I go back in the living room with my sound system. But you know what? If you want to watch a movie and you're a big film fan, you're going to try out every single movie you can. And black and white should be included in that, especially if you want to become a real cinephile. Now, I don't like to gatekeep or anything like that, but when you become a real cinephile, you want to explore as many films as you can. You kind of keep peeling back layers on your film history. You know, you just like okay maybe i'll go and explore this director now you just keep finding more and more films film fans will never run out of film even if they stop making movies now you'll still have enough movies to last you a lifetime and you have to include black and white film in that so that was a great question kevin thank you so much buddy and this one is from mr smelly potato and he wrote what are some of your favorite it's so bad it's good guilty pleasure movies for me it's Catwoman. Catwoman, man i'll never forget about that <laughs> that basketball scene in that movie i didn't really enjoy that movie but i could see why that would be a guilty pleasure movie so so a guilty pleasure movie is a movie that you can watch and you just know that it's a bad movie. It's really poorly made, but you just absolutely love it. You know, there are those movies that are very self-aware. They're, you know, they're bad almost on purpose. Then there are the movies that nobody intended to be bad. And then everyone's just like, wow, you have to see this movie. The most famous is probably The Room. That's me. 
How much is it? It'll be $18. Keep, go. Keep the change. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Tommy Wiseau's movie. I have that movie on Blu-ray, actually. And it's just so unbelievable that he made this movie. They actually had to make a movie about the making of that movie. So that's definitely the definition of it's so bad it's good. I've never seen the Miami Connection. I've heard that's one of those kinds of movies as well. But as a huge 1980s film fan, you got to go to the 80s and you're going to find a great Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that's not the greatest made and a great Arnold and a great Sylvester Stallone movie that's also not the greatest movie ever made. But they're a hell of a lot of fun. I'm talking about about Commando and Cobra. I only saw Cobra a couple of years ago, and that movie just, uh, it took me by storm. It's absolutely dumb as hell. I'll blow this off, place up! Go ahead. I don't shut her. But I enjoy every second of it. I just think it's so funny, everything that they went for in that movie. It's so entertaining. The time flies by. It's the same thing with Commando. I eat green berets for breakfast. And right now, I'm very hungry. It's got the most ridiculous of movie plots, but you get Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone banging out one-liners, just saving the day by themselves. It's unbelievable, but that's what the 1980s were like, the cocaine 80s. We just had so many of these movies, but they're just so entertaining. You know, the thing about film is, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, you know, you can watch a movie from the Criterion Collection, from Keanu Lorber, these very highbrow movies made very sophisticatedly. I can sit there and watch Tree of Life and just be so fixated on it, but then I can turn that movie on and then throw cocaine in and just absolutely enjoy that movie as well. I feel like people don't realize you can like so many different forms of cinema. You can like some really highbrow stuff. And you can also like some really lowbrow, sleazy stuff. I just recently rewatched the movie Internal Affairs. That movie makes absolutely zero sense, but Richard Gere gives, honestly, in my opinion, his greatest on screen performance in that movie. He plays one of the best villains ever. All right, all right, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna f her for a while, teach her how to c get up. Then she can show you what she likes. Andy Garcia is great in that movie. That movie's pretty stupid, honestly, if you boil it down to what it is and what's going on. But oh my god, it is so entertaining. I actually wanted to rewatch it as soon as I finished it. I love movies like that. So there are plenty of guilty pleasure movies that I absolutely love that. I really do think that you don't have to feel guilty for liking those movies. We all have those movies. U.S. Marshals, the sequel to The Fugitive. It's nowhere near as good as The Fugitive, but I absolutely love U.S. Marshals. It's basically the same movie. It's the same length, but I, I, every time U.S. Marshals is on, I'm going to watch U.S. Marshals. I don't have the Blu-ray of it. I doubt we'll ever get a 4K Blu-ray of it, but I absolutely just love U.S. Marshals. And I have plenty of movies in my collection like that, of movies that I just, you know, I know they're not great, but I have always enjoyed them. So that was a great question, Mr. Smelly Potato. Thank you so much, buddy. And this one is actually from Time Stopper 3000, and they said... The most divisive 4K you've seen that you don't know what to give it. Um, actually, it's funny because we were talking about the James Cameron 4K Blu-rays. Those came out last week. Those were, I was very worried about grading those 4K Blu-rays. I knew what to give them, but I was just worried more about the reaction of everybody else. You know, we got to be honest with ourselves. You got to give your honest opinion on these. But when a movie like, when a, when a 4K Blu-ray or a film itself comes out and it's just so divisive, everybody's just on different sides of the fences and they start fighting in the middle. And then as somebody who reviews films in 4K, blu-rays on youtube you're just opening the door for everybody to come in and just basically tell you you're wrong or people tell you're right and you're like whoa it's just it's very hard to grade 4k blu-rays like that in films in general what you're asking is like a 4k blu-ray that might just be like all over the place how do you grade that i actually had a lot of trouble with footloose when it came out a couple months ago and the reason being is because it was actually a improvement over the blu-ray but I still didn't think it looked great. So I was kind of on the fence, like, how do I grade this? You know, it's still a big improvement over the Blu-ray, but it still looks pretty bad. It still has a lot of the flaws that the Blu-ray had. You know, the audio might be better. And I was like, how do I grade this? Because it is an improvement. And then a lot of people are telling me, like, you know, oh, you know, it's taken from the original 35 millimeter camera negative. This is how it's going to look. This is how it's always looked. And again, you know, I'm not there in the 1980s, so I'm not too sure what it actually looked like projected onto the big screen. I can only go by what I've seen it on. So it's really tough because maybe when they were shooting this movie this was the best they could do maybe they had bad lighting you know that's the thing with source material it comes down to a lot of that when you're reviewing 4k blu-rays and it just makes things very very hard and i always just think in those situations you just have to be honest with how you came to the score you came to they'll just say oh this 4k blu-ray is dog shit don't watch this 4k blu-ray because that's what a lot of people do they'll just do that but they don't actually explain why you shouldn't watch this 4k blu-ray so you know the best way to do that is just explain your opinion why you liked it why you didn't like it and that's it because at the end of the day when it comes to 4k blu-rays movies in general it's very subjective some people like certain things and other people like other things and that's just the way it works it's not even just in physical media and movies it's just worldwide. We all have differing opinions. We just have to learn to respect 
each other's opinions, which I know in the world of social media is very, very, very hard to do. But when it comes down to reviewing 4K Blu-rays, I really do think it's sometimes it can be very difficult because you don't know exactly what the source material is. And I think I had the most trouble with that with the 4K Blu-ray review for Footloose because I really don't know if that movie can look any better than it actually does because Paramount, for the most part, they will put out some great looking 4K Blu-rays. Yes, they have whiffed on like Saturday Night Fever and planes, trains, and automobiles, but at other points, they put out some of the best looking 4K Blu-rays ever, so, you know, without actually talking to the people who did the transfer, it's just really my best guess, and Footloose definitely gave me a lot of trouble. So that was a great question as well, thank you so much, buddy. And the next one's from Rico Gomez, and he wrote, do you or have you visited video media forums like Home Theater Forum, DVD Talk, or Blu-ray.com's forum? And so, what do you think of that? My experience is that they get to be rough, like if you were talking politics. A lot of hot takes, bullying, banning if you don't get along with the narrative, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And that's actually a great question, Enrico. And honestly, no, I don't go into the forums of any of these sites. I'm not a big person who likes to talk on the forums. I'm not even really a big social media person. I go on the artists formerly known as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and it's really just for this channel. It's just to talk to people who watch Let's Talk. If you ever look, I'm only really working under those names. And it's just because I don't like talking on social media. I feel like it's a cesspool. And it's the same thing with the forums. You know, once people disagree with each other, they feel more open to venting their opinions in the loudest way possible because they're typing it behind a keyboard. And, you know, they would never say half of these things to your face, probably three quarters of the stuff that they say to your face. But when you're just talking about little simple things like a movie or a 4K Blu-ray and people start getting hostile, that's just absolutely ridiculous. Actually, one of the biggest names in physical media, Jeff Rahazo, Rosea, I know he said, I know he walked us through how to pronounce it on that video when he changed his YouTube channel name, but he put a video out this past week about are we taking this stuff too serious when it comes to the 4K Ultra HD format? And he's making reference to how people were reacting this past week with the James Cameron 4K Blu-rays. You know, people were all over the map with this. They were fighting. Basically, you know, the equivalent of fighting in the streets, but we're just doing it on the artists formerly known as Twitter and Instagram and Facebook or in people's comment sections of their videos. You know, people got really passionate about the those 4k blu-rays but why it's just a 4k blu-ray you're allowed to have your opinions if i give a movie a 10 out of 10 and you think that movie is a zero out of 10 that is your opinion i respect your opinion and we should all respect each other's opinion now obviously we live in the world the trolls so people just come out and they just like to rock the boat because they need attention and negative attention is still attention so they have no problem doing that and, you know, forums are filled with that. And I just like to stay as far away from that as I possibly can. I don't need that kind of negativity in my life personally. If you disagree with me, you disagree with me. That's just the way it goes. If I disagree with you, I'm not going to tell you every time I disagree with you. It is what it is. And unfortunately, you know, politics and religion are the big two. Stay away from that because that's just opening the door for so much hostility. So I never talk about politics or religion especially here on the channel, you know, if it comes up in the world of film, you know, then obviously we have to talk about my religious and political beliefs because it ties into the movie itself or the conversation. But I'm never going to come on this channel and outright tell you what I think of my politics and my religion because that's not fair to you guys. You know, I respect your opinions and I hope that you guys respect my opinions. And unfortunately, these forums, Rico, they're just filled with people who don't respect each other's opinion. They just want to get their opinion across to you. And if you disagree with them, they're going to sit there and tell you you're wrong. So I try and stay as far away from that stuff as I possibly can. But that's a great question. Question, Rico. Thank you so much, buddy. And I'm actually going to answer a couple questions I answered on last week's show, but they got cut off. You know, this happens a lot with YouTube. And actually, Kevin asked, what are my biggest YouTube pet peeves? Well, first up on that is that uh, I lose some footage sometimes because it's just me in here uh, shooting, doing the audio and everything. And sometimes things get cut off. Unfortunately, it happens. It's the name of the game when you're on your own doing a YouTube channel. But the biggest problem I ever have with YouTube is the algorithm. If you guys ever look at the views on my videos, you'll see some videos that have some super high views. And then you'll see other videos that have really low views. That's just YouTube and who they push the videos to. And unfortunately, YouTube likes your channel to be focused on one thing. So even though this is mainly a physical media channel, sometimes I like to talk about other movies. Movies that don't have a physical media tie-in or new release movies. Like you're going to see a video that came out yesterday where I did a review for both the new Roadhouse and the new Ghostbusters. I don't know what it's, I don't know how it's doing right now because I'm filming this on Friday. But if I had to guess, it's probably not doing that great. And that's because YouTube views me as a physical media channel channel so really only anything that I talk about when it comes to physical media those will get the higher views my 4k blue area views always get the highest views and that's because that's what YouTube views my channel as so if I do something else they won't push it at the beginning of the day when we first started this channel this channel is supposed to be a mishmash of 
video games, fit new releases, and physical media, whether it be for video games or film. And it kind of just transformed into this only physical media movie channel. But even when I do new movie reviews, despite movies being my main love, YouTube just won't push it. That's always my biggest problem with YouTube, and it's just their algorithm. Other than that, YouTube is actually pretty good. I know a lot of people knock them, but you know, if you reach out to them, email them, they are actually really good at responding to you, responding to your issues. They send surveys out to a lot of the creators. It's just that I feels like sometimes they will bury your stuff and it's just the algorithm itself. It's not actually anyone personally on YouTube attacking you. It's just that's kind of how we are nowadays. We're too reliant on artificial intelligence, algorithms, stuff that really does the work behind the scenes where, you know, no human being is actually doing it. I feel like if human beings see a lot of our YouTube channels, they would push them a little further. But there's so many of us out there, it just doesn't work that way. But that is a great question as well, Kevin. Thank you so much, buddy. And Kevin's next question, another question I answered last week, but it got lost in the shuffle. He wrote, how would you rank the following actors? Pauly Shore, Rob Schneider, Steven Seagal, Gwyneth Paltrow, Amber Heard, John Cusack, Dustin Hoffman, Kevin James, Sean Penn, and Michael Douglas. It's actually really funny. I guess Kevin's been watching the channel for a long time because a lot of these actors I have said are not my favorite actors or are pretty low on my personal list. But one actor on this list I absolutely love, and that'll be number one, and that's Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas is a phenomenal actor. He's been in so many great movies. He's also produced so many great movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He's just always so good, whether it be in Falling Down, The Game, and then obviously the Wall Street films. The original is probably his best film but he is always so 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 good basic instinct and number two i'll put sean penn sean penn actually there's some movies i don't love sean penn in but when he's on his a game he is absolutely fantastic and a lot of people will list the movie i am sam is probably one of sean penn's worst movies really like that movie saw it at too young of an age and you also get a great dakota fanning uh performance in that movie but i actually like that movie but usually people will use i am sam as an example of a bad sean penn movie but i like i am sam and number three despite again not being one of my favorite actors i have to put dustin hoffman at number three because he does have some great performances in movies like marathon man tootsie you know he's obviously a great actor it's just yeah, i don't really have that connection to him like a lot of other people do and that's the same thing probably with my number four actor john cusack john cusack Overall, don't love the guy, but he has been in some of my favorite films ever, like Con Air. And then obviously he pops up in movies like Gross Point Blank, where he's just so good in the lead role. 1408, he's also so good in that. But then for the most part, just not a huge fan of the guy. He's still a good actor, it's just, you know, doesn't connect to me. And then at number four, believe it or not, above all these people, I'm going to put Kevin James. Kevin James, a Long Islander, actually went to school about, I don't know, five minutes that way from where I live. So fellow Long Islander, even though he was in the show The King of Queens, he's another guy who usually pops up in a lot of Adam Sandler movies. He kind of got his big movie break with the movie Hitch, which I saw in theaters and another 10 times after that. Always kind of liked him. And, you know, then he kind of falls into the Adam Sandler way of movies where he just kind of plays the same character over and over and over again. And then you're like, all right, enough's enough here. But Kevin James, still a good actor. And that'll bring us actually to number five, which is Rob Snyder, another guy who loves to act with Adam Sandler. And it's probably the most famous out of that crowd. He was on Saturday. Saturday Night Live as well, and even in the 90s, he was in movies like Demolition Man. Then, of course, he would end up becoming a lead actor himself in movies like The Hot Chick and Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, and then European Gigolo, both movies I actually liked, <laughs> so I'm not going to sit here and lie to you guys. And The Hot Chick, I've seen The Hot Chick so many times. Again, when you're a kid in the early 2000s, you watch a movie when you're like 9 or 10 years old, you just kind of like those movies, even if they're not great. And The Hot Chick came out in, I believe, 2002. I was 10 years old, saw that movie in theaters. I loved it. What can I say? And next up, I'll put Gwyneth Paltrow. I know people love Gwyneth Paltrow. Never got it for me. I've never understood it. The best movie I ever saw her in was Seven, and that came out in 1995. Never liked her as Piper Potts in the MCU. I never really liked it. Kind of felt like she was very bland. Just any time with Gwyneth Paltrow, I just never get sucked into her. Even in, like, Contagion. Like, she has a very small role in that movie. She dies very, very fast. I just don't really love her. I would never really have loved her acting. I just, I don't know, something about her. It just doesn't work for me. And that brings us to Amber Heard. Amber Heard's another actress, so it's just very indifferent on, regardless of what happened with her and Johnny Depp. I just felt like her and Johnny Depp's marriage just kind of got aired out in front of the entire world. It sounds like they were just both horrible to each other. I just never really cared about her, so I'm just very indifferent on her. And now the last two, which are Steven Seagal and Paulie Shore. I'll put Paulie Shore above Steven Seagal, but Paulie Shore's another guy. Other in the army now and Encino Man, never really loved the guy. Other than that, honestly, his voice just uh, rings my ears. I cannot take it. He drives me nuts with his voice, but it's not his fault. Um, and then Steven Seagal. Steven, Gus Steven Seagal is a piece of shit, so I really don't like that guy, and then every time I have to see him in movies, it just makes me go, that guy I know is a horrible person, so every time I see him, I just, I hate him. I know, and it's funny because one of my friends who I work with in my, uh, uh, we'll, we'll assume you in my last Joe job, 
You know, he's, that's his favorite actor. He loves Steven Seagal, loves Steven Seagal films. The only Steven Seagal film I can honestly say I actually enjoyed was Under Siege, and that's really, it's not even really for Steven Seagal. So, you know, you get Gary Busey and Tommy Lee Jones in that movie, and I just loved Gary Busey and Tommy Lee Jones. So I didn't really like it for Steven Seagal, despite being the lead, and that's why I don't ever really run back to Under Siege. So Steven Seagal on this list is the absolute worst. Honestly, Steven Seagal might be one of my least favorite actors of all time. If you guys like Steven Seagal, though, don't let me take that away from you. Just don't like the guy. And the next Kevin Kruger question says, who do you think are the most interesting movie characters that are psychopaths? And I actually made a list of this one. And at number one, Hannibal Lecter. He's definitely the most famous movie psychopath of all time and is still probably the best. And if you go right to just the Silence of the Lambs, that is one of the best portrayals of a psychopath on screen by Anthony Hopkins. It's the reason why he won the Academy Award. Brian Cox plays the same role in Manhunter. I love Manhunter, but Anthony Hopkins, he made it his role. When you think of Hannibal Lecter, you think of Anthony Hopkins. He is so good in that movie. The next one behind him is Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. He is amazing in that movie. <laughs> and yeah, it's called American Psycho. That's because he is a psycho in the 1980s going on a killing spree. Or is he? That's the big mystery of American Psycho that does kind of answer or doesn't answer at the very end of that movie. But I still actually think that's Christian Bale's best performance. He was born to play that role. And then next up, you have to go with Norman Bates, right? He's clearly a psycho. It's from the movie Psycho. I'm, unfortunately, what led him down that path was his mother being absolutely horrible to him. But it ended up leading to him killing people. Anthony Perkins plays him so well. He's got that charm to him, but you just know lying underneath, this man is not well. And he portrays it so well through four films, actually. Uh, you guys saw my Psycho 4K Blu-ray reviews last year. I enjoy the entire franchise, to be honest with you. I think Anthony Perkins was just born to play that role. And he is perfect as Norman Bates. And then at number four, I got Annie Wilkes from the movie Misery. I mean, just an obsessed fan. And if this movie hasn't aged well with all of these obsessive fans in this world who don't who get upset when they don't get a movie or a book or a TV show work out the way they planned it, they all just go on the Facebook and scream about it. Well, back in the olden days, what we did was we waited until their car went off the road and then we kidnapped them hobbled them, and then made them write the story we wanted to write, you know, back in the good old days. So Annie Wilkes is an absolute psycho. And then at number five, Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. This guy is a sociopath. He does not have any emotions. He's just going to do what he has to do. He lives by his own code, but his own code is just absolutely sickening. I mean, this guy has his own set of morals. And he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. In fact, at very early in the movie, when he's killing this one cop, the look on his face is petrifying. And then, of course, the coin flip scene, him talking to Woody Harrelson, tell Woody Harrelson telling him, you don't got to do this. And he just gets upset, saying, why do you guys all say that? It doesn't make a difference. Ah, oh, man. Javier Bardem was so good in that movie. I mean, he actually might be one of the greatest movie villains of all time. And I think that goes without saying at this point. But that was a great question as well, Kevin. Thank you so much, buddy. And we'll do one more Kevin Kruger question this week and he wrote what would you like to see an origin story of freddy krueger before he was burned or a story about the creation of skynet well we actually kind of already gotten stories about the creation of skynet not like a direct story but you see it in terminator 2 how skynet is on the rise at cyberdyne systems you know they have the parts from the original terminator and we kind of can see that how it's growing and then we obviously explore that more in terminator 3 and then we explore it even more in terminator salvation even though it's kind of spread out across all of the terminator franchise we've kind of gotten that origin story but if they can actually make a more focused story about that just explore it from skynet's end i actually think i'd prefer that more than seeing freddy krueger before he gets burned and murdered because that story i think would be absolutely sickening because even though he's a child murderer we all know he's also a child predator which they explored in the 2010 nightmare on elm street which like we talked about earlier i think is an atrocious movie so anyway kevin thank you so much for your questions and thank you to everybody else who asked questions this week mr smelly potato rico gomez nick chang Randy Time Stopper and Tony the Lone Rider Smith. Thank you guys all so much for submitting questions. If I missed some of your questions this week, don't worry about that. We'll get to that next week. Faith will be back for next week's show as well. So if you have any questions for her, don't forget to leave those in the comment section below. If you have any questions for me, you can leave those in the comment section below as well. But as always, we'll put a post out on Wednesday for even more questions from you guys. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, turn notifications on, share this video if you could. 
Or you can even become a channel member. We have a Friends of the Channel tier. We have a Producers tier where you're going to find John Doe Juggalo, who has a YouTube channel as well that you guys should check out. Jason Martin, Mr. Smelly Potato. We even have a Director's tier where you're going to find Frank Rodriguez from Frank's Medium Reviews, my co-host of Collector's Corner. We hope you enjoyed the second episode that came out this past week. No audio issues. It just came out really good, and we hope you guys enjoyed that show. That's going to become a monthly show. But if you guys have no money to throw our way, don't worry about it. We just appreciate you checking out the video. We hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, don't forget to Get out in those streets and tell your friends about us. And then we'll be seeing you around. <laughs>